this show because of a men's health week uh, to try and talk about all of these things. And again, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. You are uh, with Dr. Ntlagani Pokumere. I'm standing in for Lynn, Dr. Lynn Kumere, who's the host of the show, Melanin Chit Chat. But as always, when she's not around, she actually invites me to come to these shows to be able to continue with the discussions that we are supposed to have. This is meant to engage with you, but most importantly, to give you the information that you so need. And today we are lucky to be joined by one of our registrars uh, from the hospital in Baragwanath Hospital in Johannesburg, Dr. Girat Mar Mataruka, who's joining us today to talk about some of the most amazing things that actually we need to share with you today that will give you information, but most importantly, to alert you of the things that you need to be, to be taking care of yourself and also to do in order to be healthy at all times. And again, we welcome you on this platform. So allow me to actually greet uh, Dr. Gerard Mataruka and uh, good afternoon, say, how are you doing? Uh, good afternoon, hi. Uh, thank you for having me, Dr. Kumete. It's a pleasure um, uh, to join you this afternoon. Well, thank you very much. Uh, would you then kindly just introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you do for a living and whether you have any special interest in the social media space? Okay, so I'm Dr. Gerald Mataruka, as you've mentioned before. Um, I'm a urology registrar um, working at Chris Baragwanath Hospital. So what that means is I'm a medical doctor uh, for more than eight years now, and I'm currently specializing in the discipline of urology. Um, of note, uh, my interests in the medical field, uh, obviously number one is surgery because urology is a surgical discipline. And number two is in the men's health space. Um, my interest in my background of having seen a lot of um, male patients, a lot of men in my practice in urology at Paraguanat, uh, it, it left me interested to want to sort of start an initiative called Indota, which is uh, wants to focus on men. As you know, Indota means men in Zulu. Um, so wanted to help men because I realized that when it comes to men's health, men sort of take um, a back seat with their health and, you know, they are not as educated about their own health and the issues that they face um, compared to women for say. So, um, so that is my passion, men's health, and um, that will be the journey that I'll probably take uh, going forward with my career. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you for that interest. Uh, it means that we actually have somebody who's mostly experienced in the topic that we're going to talk about. As you know, this week is uh, Men's Health Week. Uh, you know, I've been working in a health uh, uh, institution for a long time, and I've noticed that in some of the times... Uh, when we look at the statistics of men that actually do visit our health facilities compared to the females, it's actually very high on females compared to men. If men do come, they come very late. And uh, these actually then have a very, very serious outcome uh, into them having to then, you know, have serious uh, damages in their bodies. And then uh, sometimes that may result to, to death. M maybe, you know, Doc, uh, would you be able to tell us why is it so important that we dedicate at times such as these to actually observe and talk about men's health at this point. Yeah, so it's very, very important. I think, as you've mentioned, you're quite uh, correct when you say men, um, they don't come to hospital as often. And usually when they do come, they come very, very sick. Um, and usually if you speak to the men or if you speak to the people that bring them to the hospital, you know, usually it's either it's the wife or the children that actually pushed them to come. They were like, no, we saw that this was getting uh, worse and worse and we really had to end up forcing him. And it's, it's quite a sad thing. So, you know, it's, you know, it's very important because at the end of the day, it's the men who actually suffer when they present very, very late. You know, they present with conditions that if they had presented early could have been totally curable or you know, if they'd presented even slightly earlier, they wouldn't have suffered some of the complications that they do. Mm -hmm. So it is really, really an issue. And at the end of the day, the men suffer, their families suffer. Um, some of these men are breadwinners, you know, so mm -hmm. then you're, you're left with the family that was without a breadwinner um, because they presented late for something that was potentially curable. So, you know, we need to raise more and more awareness around these issues, more and more men 
need to be aware of the issues that they face. And, um, you know, some of these health issues are actually preventable. So yeah. if there's awareness in the community and, you know, men know more and more about their health, they'll be empowered um, to take appropriate steps to prevent some of these conditions. So I think it's very, very important. And, you know, we need every single player um, in the medical field, not only medical, you know, even collaboration with other sectors, you know, government, you know, so that we can bring about more and more um, hype and talk around the subject as it will help quite a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's very clear, you know, uh, how much of a damage it is uh, when uh, men's health particularly is actually just uh, ignored. And uh, unfortunately, we are actually, as men, we are culprits in this. And we always need to be pushed behind for us to be able to take care of our own health. And, and this really talks to behavioral change and uh, what we actually need to do. But I mean, in a time where lifestyle diseases are so prevalent, what are the biggest health concerns for men that we need to be worried about? So there's quite a few um, health concerns that regard um, men. You know, when you look at South Africa, uh, they sort of speak of a quadruple bed of, of disease that exists in South Africa. And um, on that quadruple burden of disease, three of the actual um, disease burdens, they actually affect men directly. So the first one is related to violence and injury. Um, there's the second burden of disease would be um, your lifestyle diseases. These are your non-communicable diseases. Um, and then the, the last burden disease is related to infectious diseases. Mm. Um, the fourth one that I didn't mention is related to maternal and, and neonatal health. But, you know, these first three, they actually affect men directly. Um, violence and injury and the other one um, of infectious diseases, which is mainly looking at um, HIV and TB. You know, to some extent, these are diseases of lifestyle mm. um, because, um, you know, they, they relate around to our social behavior. They re relate to our social circumstances like, like poverty, which the majority of um, South Africans uh, live under, unfortunate, you know, so these things, they affect men. Um, and, you know, there's the, also the issue of uh, alcohol and substance abuse, which many men um, actually suffer from. So this actually affects their health. So these issues need to be brought forward um, to, uh, to the fore. Then when you speak about non-communicable diseases, these are your sort of your typical lifestyle diseases. You no, know, these are your high blood pressure, your diabetes, you know, this is where men will suffer from your strokes and your heart attack, you know, obesity, um, which again is also very uh, prevalent even amongst uh, men here in South Africa, you know. So we need to raise these issues so that people are aware of, of this um, so that they can take appropriate steps to, you know, to prevent these conditions or at least um, go and be screened um, for these conditions and, and receive treatment where appropriate. So these are some of, excuse me, these are some of the, the conditions that uh, men need to be aware and worry about, you know, and there's also some other um, cancers that are very, very uh, common and prevalent in men. Some only affect men, for example, your prostate cancer, your penile cancer, your testicular cancer, you know, these are some of the cancers that affect men. And then, you know, there's other cancers that affect both in women, but are actually quite common. For example, colon cancer, you know, so there's a lot of um, issues that potentially can affect men. And, you know, we need to be involved in constant education and constant engagement um, with men in society that they are aware of these issues to, to help to prevent um, the, the sequelae from them. Yeah. So, I mean, you've mentioned quite a, a long list of issues that we should be worried about. As I'm listening to you already, I'm starting to worry myself if, you know, you know, what could I have right now? Should I go for screening and all of those type of things? But I mean, the question would be, I mean, what can men do in terms of self-care to prevent diseases and uh, what annual screening is actually advisable for them uh, so that they can detect uh, disease early? Okay, so there's quite a few, uh, quite a lot of things that uh, men uh, can do or steps that they can take uh, to avoid many of these illnesses that I was, I was um, starting or, or talking about. You know, so I believe the starting point is um, 
we need to attend um, uh, checkups, you know, your, your routine medical assessment. It's, it's very, very important. You know, the stats say that men are 24% less likely than women to undergo annual routine medical checkup, you know, and this is actually the problems, where the problems start. We always say, you know, uh, women live longer than men. It's actually not a surprise because women are, are constantly um, in contact with our health system at some point. You know, another advantage which women have is women fall pregnant. And when they are fall pregnant, they, you know, they, they are forced to seek health care, you know. And when they're in the health system, other illnesses, if they exist, they get picked up. Yeah. But for men, unfortunately, we don't have that fallback mechanism. So it means we need to actually to, to be more proactive. So yeah. you asked a good question. What are the, some of the things that men can do? So the first one is, you know, we all need to attend um, annual medical checkups, you know, just your general checkup, you go and see someone, you know, whether it is at a, a primary care clinic, or it is a GP, someone must go in and assess you. And well, the recommendation that we give at Teen Daughter is that from age 20, you go and you have a, a, a medical checkup. If everything is fine, if there's no issues, then you can go for your next checkup in the next five years. You know, and in that that initial checkup, they need to measure your blood pressure um, because hypertension can affect many men, even from an early uh, young age. Young men, some young men have hypertension, and also measure your blood cholesterol levels. Yeah, you know, if those two those two are fine and there's no issues that are picked up, then you can wait for about five years for your next checkup. the The next check that they need to do you need to have your prostate assessment. So prostate cancer is a very, very common uh, cancer. Um, actually worldwide is the number one cancer that affects men. It's even much more common in Africa and especially in South Africa, you know, so uh, you need your prostate check. However, prostate cancer, it's very rare in men under the age of 40. It's extremely yeah. rare. We, we don't see it often, it can happen, but in men under 40, we, we barely see it. So the recommendation is for someone who doesn't have a family history of prostate cancer, um, from age 45, they can start having their prostate check. And what the prostate check involves is, you know, uh, the doctor will do a blood test, testing your PSA, which is an enzyme from the prostate. And uh, depending on how high the level is, it can give an indication or suspicion of prostate cancer. The second thing, unfortunately, it's a slightly uncomfortable and many men don't like the second test. It's when the doctor, um, you know, he performs a, a rectal examination, the doctor will insert the finger um, into the patient's bum to feel the prostate gland because how the prostate gland feels, it can give an indication on whether there's cancer or not. So that is your prostate check, but it's only from age 45 that we really need to worry about that one. Also at age 45, um, we, we recommend that men start screening for diabetes or, or your, your blood sugar, you know? So, you know, you need to be checked for diabetes from age 45 because from that age, it becomes much more common, um, you know, the type two diabetes, which is you know, the one related to the lifestyle. Um, so from age 45, your diabetes should be checked. Um, and then, you know, from age 50, uh, one should also be assessed for colon cancer. Um, and this involves a, a colonoscopy, um, which means a, a camera or a tube with a camera is again put uh, through your anus and it assesses the large intestine or the large colon to see is there any suspicion or any signs of, of cancer there. And this test is also is an uncomfortable test, but fortunately it's only done once every 10 years if, if, um, if the check was was clear. Um, so these are the, are the main tests that, that men need to go for. Um, some of these tests, they're not only for, for, for men, even women uh, suffer from diabetes, high blood, but you know, but these checks need to be done um, for, you know, so that if there's any issues, um, they can be picked up early and men can get the relevant help. So it's quite interesting, I mean, to note that you know, we've got quite a lot of like, it's almost like a plan for men 
that actually every man is supposed to know when to actually go for screening or physical examination on a regular basis, which is actually a basic principle of primary health care to say that, you know, everybody needs to attend to their health and they need to visit, uh, you know, the health facilities regularly. And we, we see this. And uh, over the years, we've actually noted that in the sub-Saharan Africa and all of that, we've seen a high increase of non-communicable diseases. And some people say that we have concentrated more on sexually transmitted diseases like HIV and we've put more money in there. And we've forgotten to actually then be able to learn about the good practices of uh, HIV management into non-communicable diseases. But I mean, in another discussion, I mean, we have men who often, you know, dismiss matters like intimacy, like, uh, you know, uh, erectile dysfunction, subfertility and, uh, you know, infertility. But the presence of men's clinic and specialities like what you are doing, urology, means that, I mean, there's a need for men to get help. So when should men be worried and when, what can they try safely on their own before seeking help? Yeah, so you, you raise a very important question, you know, around the issues of infertility, um, erectile dysfunction. These are, are very, very important questions. Um, so looking at infertility, sorry, I'll start with erectile dysfunction. So yeah. looking at erectile dysfunction, um, so, you know, the, the definition of, of erectile dysfunction, you know, from from the textbook is that this is the ability of a man to be able to attain um, an erection um, that uh, is strong enough to permit sexual intercourse and the ability of the man to maintain this erection to be able to complete um, satisfactory sexual intercourse. Um, so, you know, you know, that last part of saying satisfactory sexual intercourse, you know, it's sort of brings it to make it sort of in a, a subjective thing because yeah. what is uh, satisfactory intercourse for you, it may be different for, for somebody else. Um, but, you know, it's such a, a very, very important thing. And, you know, for me, I, I always tell people when you suffer from erectile dysfunction, at the first sign, do not ignore it because it might be a sign that is very, very important. You know, usually erectile dysfunction is seen as a marker of underlying undiagnosed heart disease, yeah. you know. So for some men, when they actually find out there's problems with the heart, the first sign is the loss of the erection or, or a weak erection. That is the first sign many men will have of heart disease. So for me, my advice to any man who's got any new onset of erectile dysfunction before, uh, you know, you are functioning quite well, you're getting your erections, you're having strong erections, and then now all of a sudden, when it comes into the bedroom, you are struggling. I think that man should seek for help. Do not ignore it. Do not say it will, it will, it will just get better by its own. Yeah. Obviously, there are circumstances where erectile dysfunction is situational. For example, you are under a lot of stress. Maybe you are worried about, you know, the financial situation of the family. You're worried what are, what will the kids eat and whatnot. You know, so stress can actually cause erectile dysfunction. But I mean, you would know yourself that when you're actually suffering from extreme stress, you know that, you know, actually I'm, I'm not right. This thing is on my mind is bothering me. So obviously that will affect your, your performance. That one is not a surprise. But, you know, for someone who's not under those situations of extreme stress, you know, or these no severe relationship issues at the time, you know, Erectile dysfunction shouldn't be ignored, and you know men should actually seek um, help at the first sign, so that you know if they if there is a problem, this problem is detected early, and hopefully it can be fixed or improved upon. When it comes to fertility, uh, or in subfertility, infertility, this one is slightly more of a complex uh, issue because fertility usually when we view fertility. We usually view fertility as a couple, mm. you know, so if a couple is having fertility problems, you know, it's important that you assess both the men and both the women, you know, mm. and you actually take a, a thorough history from them and examine both parties, um, you know, thoroughly, separately, and then also do relevant tests. And 
actually interesting enough the the definition of fertility is the inability of a sexually active couple um unable to to um, conceive within one year so you'll find some people you know they, they are together maybe they recently got married and then after six months they come to you and they say doc we're having a problem you know according to the definition it is still quite early um, yeah. because it's natural that sometimes it can take time for for couples to fall pregnant yeah and then also sometimes with the infertility there's issues related to you know you always need to ask the question that you know how often are you as a couple actually engaging in sexual intercourse because you'll find maybe for example maybe the husband and wife or you know the two partners they live separate and they only meet you know for a short space of time maybe during holidays you know in december and then you know they are saying you know we are struggling to conceive obviously that would affect you know, and we always uh, advise that a couple seeking to, to fall pregnant must be engaged in regular intercourse, you know, three times a week at least to give yourself um, a good enough chance for you to fall pregnant. The other issue, you know, that is also important is the timing of the intercourse as well, you know, because this is where the importance of knowing the cycle, um, or the, the, the menstrual cycle of the woman is important. Um, because if the woman knows the cycle, and she would be able to know that if my cycle is 28 days long, you know, from day around day, uh, day 12 to about day 16, that is most likely when I'm ovulating or when the egg is released, you know, and actually during that period, that is the most important time where sexual activity must happen, you know, because that is where your biggest chance of falling pregnant is. Um, and also, it's also important, some couples, you know, they'll be saying, Doc, we are struggling to have a child. And you find, you know, they, they're actually using some form of contraception as well. It's also important to make sure that no contraception is being used. Um, it happens sometimes, you know, like um, frequently some women after they, they deliver, you know, many of them are given an injection, which lasts several months, yeah. you know, and maybe if they're trying again, they may not be aware that actually that injection I got three months ago is probably still active in my body. And this might be a reason. Yeah. You know, so there's actually quite a lot of issues, but I think the important thing is if you're worried and if you feel like there's a problem, do not ignore it. Problems don't just get better by themselves. You need to seek um, for help. I know a lot of men, you know, when it comes to these issues of erectile dysfunction, they try a lot of things. You know, they buy this, you know, from the pharmacy. There's a lot of guys who are selling things on the streets that, you know, even us, we don't know what is in those products you know yeah. those things um, are, are not safe you don't know what you are putting into your body so it's not advisable to go for those products go and seek help so that they see is there actually a problem and you know they can take it from there that is um, our advice yeah that's great uh, uh, doc uh, because i mean where there is a smoke there is always fire so if mm. somebody feels that there's actually something that is not going uh, normal according to you know the expectation then they need to be able to actually get an advice from a person that is well trained to be able to give them uh, you know the health advice instead of just uh, going and doing things by themselves and uh, which sometimes they can do things that actually can harm them in the future now I mean when we speak about this I mean this is the common a reason why men would actually decide to say, you know what, we're going to see a doctor now because, you know, I can't get my, uh, uh, my, 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 my person to actually elevate and to do the job. So that's what, you know, a day I need to go and see a doctor because this thing is actually, you know, messing around with my life. And the common question would be, once a doctor tells me that I have an erectile dysfunction or maybe I have a, you know, I'm infertile for whatever reason, is this thing always reversible or curable? So it's, it's a very good question. Um, so obviously, once th they present with this problem, uh, the first step is to do a, a thorough assessment. So you take a thorough medical history, um, you'd examine the patient thoroughly, um, you know, check all of these things, the blood pressure, the blood sugar, um, you know, you, you do the physical examination, you check the manhood to see, is the man normal? Are there any abnormalities? 
um, on the manhood, you, you, you check the, the, the size of the testicles because sometimes that can be a contributing factor. You know, and there's even other tests that are done, blood tests as well, to help the doctors to, to figure out what could be the cause. You know, even an ECG to check, you know, the electrical activity of the heart as well. So all these tests are done. So when it comes to that question on, is this reversible? I think that the first answer to that question is it actually depends on what is the cause um, of the problem. You know, some causes, um, they, they can be... Um, sort of fixed or they can be improved. So for example, maybe if the person has got, you know, underlying diabetes, which they did not know about and which was uncontrolled, you know, once you start treating the diabetes, then um, the underlying erectile problem can also improve once also the blood pressure. Uh, so once the, the diabetes control, the blood sugar um, improves. So it, it depends on the cause. Secondly, the, the import, other important thing is with this, um, this illness, especially when it comes to erectile dysfunction, there's quite a lot of risk factors that are involved. Um, so you need to look at every possible risk factor and see which risk factor can we correct. Um, the number one risk factor, unfortunately, which we cannot do anything about is age. Mm. You know, so as a man gets older, unfortunately, your sexual function is likely to decline. Um, yeah. A man who's 70 years old, unfortunately, cannot perform um, as well as a man who's 20 years old, you know. For some men, this decline is much more um, compared to others, but that is one of the factors. And unfortunately, we cannot do anything about that one. However, there are many other risk factors that we can we can um, modulate or sort of change. Uh, for example, if a man is obese, obesity is also another cause that contributes to this problem of um, erectile dysfunction. So the advice is let us look into ways in which this person can lose weight. How can we help them to lose weight? You know, so we speak about physical exercise, you know, we speak about making changes to the diet. Mm -hmm. These are things that we can change that can help the problem. You know, if there's high blood pressure, you know, it's important that we treat the high blood pressure um, and control the blood pressure. That's something else that can be changed and modified. The other thing that I mentioned was cholesterol. So we check the blood cholesterol level. So if the cholesterol in the blood is elevated, there are tablets that can be used in conjunction with the diet to try and lower that cholesterol because it also um, has an effect. Other factors, smoking, you know. Mm. So smoking is another big one. It affects, um, you know, your blood vessels and therefore it will affect, you know, your, your, the, the strength of your erection. So if someone with erectile dysfunction who smokes, they need to cut down on their smoking and actually stop smoking because it is something that is contributing to the problem. And, you know, unfortunately, unless if they modify that risk factor, they may not get improvement. Smoking is another one. Mm. The other one that is also very uh, commonly used by many men is alcohol. Alcohol also affects your erections, you know. So there's quite a lot of things that can actually be modified um, you know, that, you know, you need to look at one by one to see, is this a problem in my patient? In, um, so it's important for each patient, um, you look at all these risk factors in, in risk factors uh, so that we can, um, you know, see, is, is this applicable to this patient, to this individual? If it is, you work on it. And all these small little changes at the end of the day, they actually bring, bring about a, a bigger and improved picture, you know. Unfortunately, as I've mentioned, sometimes the, the cause of the erectile dysfunction may be something that is um, unfortunate, cannot be changed for or, or, um, or fixed. You know, for example, if, you know, someone suffers a car accident and they get an injury to the spine, yeah. if, the, if the nerves um, that are running through the spine are damaged, unfortunately, we cannot do anything to replace those nerves. And, you know, some causes are, um, are unchangeable. So... You know, a thorough assessment needs to be done and some risk factors can be, 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 be changed and modulated. When it comes to inf infertility, you know, infertility is a very um, complex one. But again, there are also things that also affect your infertility. You know, like your, your level of stress. If someone is under extreme stress, you know, you, we know that, you know, the, the quality of your semen goes down and this mm -hmm. affects 
um, your, your fertility. You know, if someone smokes, again, smoking is another risk factor that affects your fertility. You know, if there was perhaps maybe a, a previous infection that involved the testicle and maybe it might have caused testicular damage, that might be something that can affect your fertility. And, you know, some of these things, you cannot reverse damage that has been done. Uh, so there's a lot of factors as well with infertility, but, you know, I think what's important is a healthy lifestyle is very important. Uh, you know, for those that smoke and uh, consume alcohol, it's advisable that, you know, they cut down on their use of these substances, um, you know, and eventually stop because unfortunately they do have a, a negative impact uh, regarding, you know, your fertility and your erectile function. Wow. Yeah, Doc, I mean, you, you've highlighted one of the most important things and uh, such thing is that what we need to do is to, you've emphasized on, uh, you know, the relevance of a periodical uh, self-examination with your health practitioner anywhere you have so that you can, you know, early, you, you know, diagnose some of those problems that can be reversible. And that is the importance of actually doing those checkups that you were actually talking about earlier on when we talk about that, uh, you know, a young man of 20 years of age, they need to start from there actually uh, seeing a doctor and then uh, then you, you then they get to, to get to be seen if they don't present with anything after five years or so, and then to be able to then uh, continue with their checkups and things like that. But I mean, we can never talk enough about things like prostate cancer, for instance. Would you please tell us about the prevalence, uh, the prognosis and the different possible treatment options thereof? Yeah, so prostate cancer is a very, very uh, big topic. You know, if there's one cancer men need to know about, they can forget about everything else and only remember prostate cancer mm. because that is one cancer that many men are at risk of. Um, you know, and the statistics um, will tell you that one in four men have got a lifetime risk of getting prostate cancer. Mm. You know, that is very, very, you know, prevalent. One in four men in your lifetime sure. have got a risk of getting prostate cancer. So this cancer is very, very common. Every man needs to know about prostate cancer. You know, um, so so what causes prostate cancer? So there's um, so the first thing is prostate cancer occurs in males. Um, the biggest risk factor is age. So the older you get, the higher your chance of getting prostate cancer becomes. Um, as I've mentioned, it's very rare under men under 40. We don't see it very often. Um, so usually when we talk about checking for prostate cancer, we don't usually talk to men who are under 40 unless maybe in your family, there's a history of someone in your family who had prostate cancer at a young age, mm. being less than 55. So if you know someone in your family, you know, whether it's your, your father, your, your uncles, whether uncles on paternal or maternal side um, who had prostate cancer, it could be your bigger brother as well, cousins who are males. If they've had prostate cancer at age of 55, then you need to check slightly earlier. Um, compared to those who don't have a history of young prostate cancer in their family. Mm. So age is number one risk factor. Other risk factors that exist is the ethnicity or the race. Um, unfortunately, as black males, and you know, this is a platform that uh, seems to be targeting more um, black individuals, is that black males are at a higher risk. It's very unfortunate, but unfortunately, this is the fact. So we need to be more aware and we need to take more action and precaution um, in screening for this illness because it affects us more. So black males are at a higher risk compared to other races. Uh, the other risk factor that happens is if you've got someone in your family who's had prostate cancer, that is a mm. family history, then you are more likely to get prostate cancer. Mm. So this is very important. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes as Africans, Sometimes we don't know our family histories and, you know, that affects us. You know, you just hear, no, no, you know, grandpa was, was very sick. Yeah. But, you know, we need to go the next step and say, but what was the issue? You know, did he attend? Did the doctor say anything? Because sometimes critical information comes out of this 
that can help the next generation you know and you know we need to be aware of our our, our family histories and and start um looking at uh, our family histories other things that affect your risk of prostate cancer um there's a smaller um a risk posed by your diet so a diet that is high in saturated fats hmm. you know um, also puts you at risk of of getting uh, prostate cancer um, smoking increases your risk marginally very slightly but it can increase your risk of prostate cancer so it's important that again we know the risk factors and as you've seen the major risk factors we cannot change yeah. we cannot change that we are black we cannot change that we're getting older. We cannot change the families that we're born into and that family risk. So unfortunately, prostate cancer, there's not much we can change to decrease our risk. So if this brings about the importance of then we need to go and be screened for this illness so that you know if it's there underlying, it can be picked up. Yeah. So I mentioned that from age 45, this is where you need to do your check. It's the blood test and the examination where the doctor puts the finger in the palm. Yeah. And if there's anything abnormal from those two, the doctor will then do take it further and do a biopsy, which is a small piece of meat from the prostate is taken and that is sent to the lab for assessment. And they will say, is there cancer or not? Yeah. In terms of is prostate cancer curable? Um, yes, it is very much curable, but it actually depends on the stage at which it was caught. You know, if you come in with prostate cancer that is spread to all the other organs, is spread to the liver, is spread to the bones, sometimes it can spread to the brain. Mm. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do for that individual. Um, so this brings about the importance of saying, let's try and detect this illness much early. Yeah. Um, if it is detected early, for some men with prostate cancer, we don't even need to give them treatment. If we If we pick it up early enough, we can say, okay, you've got prostate cancer, but your cancer is very low risk. Uh, we are happy enough to watch you from time to time. And yeah. we can tell the patient, if you want, you can come back after a certain number of months. We do the, the, the checks again. And if we see that your cancer is becoming more active, then we can you know, start discussing what treatment to give you. So for some men with prostate cancer don't need to get any treatment at all. Um, yeah. So that is a very important point. I think it will encourage men to actually yeah. go and check a because if you picked up early and your doctor says, look, you've got cancer, but your cancer doesn't need treatment, I can see you again in three months' time. I think many men would actually be happy with such news because they know, okay, it's not, it's under control. There's nothing to worry about. Other treatment options that exist. Um, so there can be surgery where the prostate, the entire prostate gland is taken out. Um, so, you know, that is a, a radical prostatectomy. Mm. Um, so mm. this surgery... Uh, is is it's got a better outcome in men who are younger and you know younger we're talking about men under the age of 60 so you know men who are younger under the age of 60 and they've got a low stage or an early stage of prostate cancer you know these are candidates for surgery and then there's other treatments like radiation therapy where you know they radiate the area where the prostate gland is to burn any cancer cells um, and it's actually effective and it can actually get rid of all cancerous prostate cancer cells. Mm. Um, and then there's also hormonal treatments that we give for patients, um, which it involves an injection that is given to men every three months. This hormonal treatment in itself, it doesn't remove prostate cancer, but sometimes we use it as a bridging therapy, you know, Unfortunately for, for us, especially in, in Gauteng, and I'm sure maybe other provinces have got the same problem, you know, there is a delay in which we can offer some curative treatment to some patients because the burden um, on the system is just a lot. So, for example, you know, for, for some men to get radiation, it can actually take two years before they are given their radiation treatment. So we bridge them by giving them hormone treatments which just arrests all the prostate cancer cells. It doesn't mm. remove the cancer mm. cells, but it arrests all the activity of these cells and um, the cancer doesn't continue to grow. So there's hormonal treatments. And then the, the last treatment that is available, and this is for men that have prostate cancer that is um, actually spread beyond the prostate is 
sometimes we do an operation where we actually remove the testicles or the balls. Uh, so we actually castrate patients uh, surgically because it's been found that the testosterone that is produced by the testicles, it, the cancer cells, they use that testosterone to grow. So, yeah. you know, in men with prostate cancer that has spread, um, we sometimes uh, offer them to, to remove the testicles as a way of controlling their cancer. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it can be, you know, mentally, it, it can be something that is difficult for, for men to sort of grasp that, you know, you're going to remove my testicles, I'll no longer be a man. That's yeah. what some men say. But unfortunately, it, it is an option um, that sometimes we, a route that we have to take, you know, and to avoid that, I think it, it even brings about the, it emphasizes the point that men should actually attend screening early so that let it be picked up early so that you don't end up having some of these complications. Just a, a final point on prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is a slow growing cancer. Mm. Um, so if there was a cancer that, you know, if someone held a gun to your head and said, choose a cancer you're going to have, choose prostate cancer because it's actually a slow growing cancer. So if it is detected early, this cancer grows slowly and it can be very well controlled. So it's not a bad cancer to have provided that it's picked up early. Yeah. That's point yeah. number one. Point um, number two is many men um, with prostate cancer, they don't die from prostate cancer. Hmm. They die yeah. from other illnesses that kill everyone else. They die from their diabetes. They die from a heart attack. You know, he gets hit by a car, something yeah. like that. That's what happens to many men with prostate cancer. Many men don't die from prostate cancer. They die with their cancer, you know, yeah. and for many of them, it doesn't cause them problems from a day-to-day -day basis. So the importance of screening in prostate cancer can never be overemphasized. It's extremely, extremely important. Men, let's go into our prostate checks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Doc, for such a, a very uh, in-depth explanation of, you know, some of the risk factors, you know, the causes, and uh, also the diagnostic procedures, as well as the treatment modalities that actually exist uh, when it comes to the prostate cancer. We thought that we couldn't let this opportunity pass by without giving you an opportunity to actually explain this to our listeners. You know, since we've spoken about, you know, prostate cancers, I mean, uh, now one would want to know what are other types of cancers that can actually occur in the male reproductive system and uh, which ones are more common than others? So the other male reproductive um, cancers that happen, so there's, there's two major ones apart from prostate cancer. The first one is penile cancer. Um, so this is cancer of the actual manhood or the penis. Um, worldwide, penile cancer is actually very rare. However, in our setting in South Africa and in Africa, it's actually more common than it should be. And this is because now with HIV, we found that there's been a spike or an increase in penile cancer. You know, penile cancer is usually a disease that used to affect men between ages 60 to 70. Now with HIV, we are seeing that men in the age group of 40 to 60 starting to develop this penile cancer. Mm. So it's becoming more and more common with HIV um, because men with HIV, unfortunately, penile cancer grows much faster in those men. Mm. So what causes penile cancer? Um, so penile cancer is linked to the virus called HPV. This is the same virus um, that also is an initiating factor of cervical cancer in women. Mm. So, you know, it, the whole process starts with, um, with infection with HPV, which is a, a sexually transmitted infection and usually when you're infected with HPV, you don't have any signs mm. um, at the time of infection to know that there is a problem. So it starts with infection with HPV. Then there are other risk factors that um, increase your chances of penile cancer developing. So the risk factors would be age. The older you get, the chances increasing bit by bit. Mm. Uh, HIV infection, as I've mentioned. Um, the other one is um, circumcision. So in communities or in societies where um, male 
children or male infants was circumcised as neonates. This is as newborns in the first month of life. Yeah. In those societies, yeah. penile cancer is almost never seen mm. in those societies. Yeah. So, you know, so neonatal circumcision um, actually is a prevention for penile cancer. Yeah. Um, so that, that's another risk factor in uh, uncircumcised men. Then there's also a link to, to hygiene. So mm. in men who've got poor hygiene um, of, um, you know, of, of uh, poor hygiene, poor penile hygiene, this puts them at a higher risk of developing penile cancer. So penile cancer is, is something that we also need to be aware about. Uh, I advise men, if you notice any funny lumps or bump on your penis, do not ignore it. Yeah. Go and have it checked out immediately. You know, if for any reason you, you know, you urinate blood, uh, do not ignore that. It could be a sign of penile cancer. Have it checked out immediately. And the treatment for penile cancer, you know, unfortunately, you have to cut out the, the actual cancer or the lesion. Yeah. And, you know, again, this comes in into late presentation. You know, there are men who they present so late that, when you now look at the penis, you don't even know what is the penis now. It's all yeah. just full of cancer. Mm. You know, and unfortunately, the treatment is you have to um, you know, cut out the cancer, cut out the entire penis as the treatment. And again, think about it as a man. You know, one of the things that you know, men sort of use to define their, them as men is actually your manhood. Precise. So it actually can be quite a debilitating thing. Um, and some a hard thing for many men to grasp that the doctor actually wants to remove my manhood. Mm. But unfortunately, you know, if there's cancer, what can we do? Because it will continue to spread bit by bit. Um, sometimes we don't remove all of it. Sometimes we can remove just a piece, depending on where the location of, of the cancer is. Mm. But again, my advice is any funny lesion that you see on your penis, do not ignore it. Go and have it checked out as soon as possible. Wow. So that is penile cancer. Um, the other important cancer that men need to know about is testicular cancer. Yeah. So testicular cancer, this in the age group of 20 to 40 years, this is actually the most common uh, solid organ uh, cancer. So between ages of 20 and 40, that is the highest risk. So the importance of, of self-examination of the testes, you know, as a man, if, you know, we advise at least once a month, just feel your, your balls or your testicles, feel if, if you think there's any funny lump that you feel, go and have it checked out, let a doctor examine you and see, is it something suspicious or not? Because the problem with testicular cancer is that it's usually painless. Yeah. So there is no sign for you to know there's something wrong. So this cancer can grow bit by bit without you feeling any pain. And then at the end of the day, by the time you realize that my, my testicle is actually big, you know, it could be uh, so far gone. So testicular cancer is the other important cancer that men need to be aware about. And um, they can take steps by regularly um, examining their testicles to see, do they feel any funny lumps or bumps? Or is there a new bump? That, that they're feeling which they didn't feel before. So those are the two main other uh, um, uh, gen uh, genital uh, cancers that men need to be aware about. Wow, thank you very much, Doc. Uh, uh, Dr. Mataruka, you know, you speak about self-examination of, uh, you know, your testes. It's something that we always hear, uh, you know, uh, as an advice that we give to particularly women to actually feel. Uh, their breasts so that they can identify, you know, anything that is like lumps in them, uh, you know, to diagnose uh, breast cancer early. And uh, you speak about testicular cancer, and it's something that we also need to do with our balls to actually feel if there's anything, uh, you know, uh, untoward so that we can report it on time. But I mean, we speak about that, and I'm just reminded of the breast cancer in women. Can men actually get breast cancer? So it's a it's a very good question, Dr. Kumede, that you you're asking. So yes, men can get breast cancer, and unfortunately, again, it's something that many people don't know that breast cancer can affect men as well. Um, 
it's not as common as it affects women, but men can still get breast cancer. So the statistic says that one in every hundred of all our breast cancers are actually um, from uh, okay in men, one in hundred. So one percent of all breast cancers okay in men. Um, so they can get it. The symptoms are, are the same as in women. Usually yeah. it's a painless mass. Uh, sometimes there might be a discharge uh, of the nipple or sometimes there might be inversion of the nipple. Um, so men should, can get uh, breast cancer as well. Uh, there's risk factors, uh, which is mostly it's genetic risk factors. So if there's a, a genetic mutation uh, that we call your BRCA1 and 2, those are genetic mutations associated with breast cancer. Yeah. And also is, there's a family history of breast cancer. So if someone in your family had breast cancer, even if it's your auntie, you are also at risk of getting breast cancer. So those are some of the risk factors that are involved um, with uh, with with um, breast cancer in men. So again, the advice is if you see anything funny uh, occurring on your nipple as men or uh, in your breast region, go and have it checked out. It's it's very important. You know, most men, you know, they've got flat flat nipples. There, there's nothing there, so it's easy to notice if something is happening. Um, so go and have it checked out. Um, unfortunately, for for men who drink a lot. Um, we they get what we call men boobs, which is gynecomastia. Yeah. Um, that is not cancer, but uh, you know it's just an increase in 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 the breast tissue uh, from the, you know the the alcohol abuse it can also be um, caused by other uh, medical illnesses. But the point is, if you are worried, if you see something is developing, rather go and have it checked out and let the doctor say that no, actually this is not nothing to worry about. Then you're just assuming, oh no, it's because I drink. That's why you know my 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 breasts as a man are, are, are growing or something like that. All right, thank you very much, uh, Doc. I mean, men usually would have sexually transmitted infections, and then I mean, what would be the sequela of recurrent sexually transmitted infections in men? So this is another important one, and actually. Um, you know, so some of the, the saddest, um, what can I say, conditions that, that we treat, one of them is um, what we call a urethral stricture. Mm. So urethral stricture, basically the pipe that carries urine from the bladder going through the penis in men called your urethra, um, you know, when there's an infection, a sexually transmitted infection, at some point there's an injury on the inside of that pipe. And the inflammatory process that happens, you know, months and years after the, the initial injury, it is progressive. And what happens is that they ends up being a complete or a total blockage um, at that point, and men are unable to pee hmm. um, because of that. They struggle a bit by bit progressive up to a point where they cannot pee through um, that pipe. And, you know, they come to us you know, they are blocked with urine and then we have to find other means to insert a pipe because we cannot unblock it through the penis. So that is one of the things, uh, urethral strictures, um, mm -hmm. that can happen from a, as a consequence of sexually transmitted infection. There's other things that can happen. Uh, men can get chronic pelvic pain, which is pain in that, in that pelvic area. This can be a, re a result of an old uh, or recurrent uh, sexual uh, transmitted infection. The other complications that can happen, um, so you, it can be infertility because uh, when you get an STI, sometimes the, the testicles can be involved and it can cause testicular damage and lead to infertility. Um, sometimes, you know, if the STI is syphilis, for example, so syphilis has got a primary, secondary, and a tertiary stage. You know, and the tertiary stage occurs 10 to 30 years after the primary infection. So once this stage happens, you know, you can get um, organ damage related to your brain, mm. um, also your heart, so even your eyes. So, you know, there can be vision loss. Um, the men can develop dementia. You know, they, they start sort of in loose terms, losing their mind at an early age. Um, you know, it can also affect the heart. So there's quite a lot of um, complications that can happen 
from uh, sexually transmitted infection. You know, even if you look at HIV, HIV now we can control it with um, medication, but unfortunately some of those medications, because they are strong medications, they come with side effects, yeah. you know. So you being on these medications for a long time, you can suffer many side effects. So these are some of the, the complications related to uh, sexually transmitted infections that are long-term that we, we need to think about and actually tell people that they're actually okay. Because for some people, they think, oh, if I get an STI, I just go to the doctor, it gives me antibiotics for a few days, it's finished. Yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes they can be long-term complications. Yeah. I think, I mean, all of these things, uh, Doc, actually talk to how we need to engage in protected uh, sexual relations with our partners, especially if we are not in a long-term relationship and uh, whether we are not married, and also to try and prevent ourselves from getting these sexually transmitted, uh, you know, infections. And I, I get an understanding that, uh, an impression that people always worry and only worry about HIV when it comes to sexually transmitted diseases. And uh, people are almost ignorant about all the other types of uh, sexually transmitted infections and what damage they can actually, uh, you know, make uh, in the future. But now, I mean, we spoke about personal hygiene, uh, especially penal hygiene previously, but how big of a role does personal hygiene play in uh, prevention of, pre I mean, infections and uh, more importantly, uh, the external male productive organs? So it, it, it does play a role. Um, so in men with poor hygiene, some of the issues that can happen, they can have localized skin infections that are around their men or in the, in the pubic area. That can be a problem. So that's, that's number one. She does play a role. Um, the other thing is, um, so personal hygiene or poor personal hygiene has been implicated in um, male UTIs, so urinary tract infections. So it can be a contributing cause to, to men getting urinary tract infections um, as well. And also personal hygiene or poor personal hygiene can increase your chance of you getting um, sexually transmitted infection. Because yeah. with poor personal hygiene, there's um, increased chances or there could be localized damage to, to, to the skin on the manhood. And when there's any damage on, 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 on the skin of the manhood, it increases your chance of a sexually transmitted infection should you engage in unprotected intercourse. So. Personal hygiene is something that is very, very important, not just for the hygiene reasons, but also for, you know, it, it can protect you from getting other things like urinary tract infections and uh, sexually transmitted infections as well. Wow. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, I think, you know, we've exhausted almost, uh, you know, what I would say the most important uh, things around, you know, male reproductive organ and uh, issues that actually pertain to, uh, you know, uh, sexuality and, uh, you know, the health of a, uh, a man. But, you know, one thing that lingers around most of the time is actually the issues around mental health care, you know, in, 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 in men. And we know, you know, uh, that we've been given this social status in our communities to say a man is made of steel. I'm strong and I cannot be, uh, you know, be defeated. But should we start putting mental health care at the center of men's health, contrary to what we always, uh, uh, you know, say about men uh, being made of steel? You know, Dr. Kumete, we really do. Um, it's, it's, it's really sad and it's unfortunate. Mental health is really killing us. Um, you know, it's, it's got a really bad impact upon us you know and also especially in the black community it's it's really have a big impact why because you know even in in our um in our black community you know you'll hear people saying no these things of depression they're not part of our culture you know you know again as you're saying a lot of things are said about men being made of steel like ah, indo taikali you know all yeah. of these things they all contribute to to the issue and there's a lot of stigma around uh, mental illness you know if I go you know and I'm, I'm I'm suffering from mental illness and I go to a psychiatric you know place you know people will talk a lot of things but I you know that man is is crazy now and all those things so that stigma all of these things it's 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 really um making mental mental health a, a bigger issue than it really is it really is a big issue but the stigma around yeah 
it and you know the socialization of you know a man has to be strong a man cannot be seen as weak all of those things they, they increase the problem you know depression is very very common um, mm. in our society you know especially in for uh, those who, who dwell in, in urban areas or urban dwellings it's much more common than in your rural dwelling so depression is very very common you know men need to be aware of depression they need to be aware of the signs of depression. You know, if you have someone around you, perhaps maybe they are now becoming absent um, from work, suffering from absenteeism, you know, or maybe they are now becoming more and more dependent on, on substances. Maybe they are now drinking more and more alcohol than they were before. Or, you know, sometimes it's not even alcohol. Sometimes it could be something as simple as, as coffee. Yeah. You find someone, they have to drink more and more coffee just to cope mm -hmm. with you know what they normally had to cope sometimes it is a sign that there's something actually happening you know so these things need to be to be brought to the fore we need to know the signs of depression um so that you know if we see someone with signs of depression you know we can advise them to go and seek appropriate help because there's a lot of organizations that deal with um, depression anxiety that can help us uh you know mental health is really really um, a big problem you know, the other issue, not just depression, is, is the issue of suicide. Yeah. Um, there's quite a lot of men who are actually committing suicide in this day and age, you know, and that is another problem that, that exists. South Africa is actually number eight in the world when it comes to suicide rate. Sure. Suicide is very, very common in South Africa. You know, they say each and every single day there's 230 people that attempt suicide in South Africa, yeah. and of which, unfortunately... Yeah. 23 of those people are successful sure. so we lose 23 lives a day to suicide and suicide is three times more common in men compared to women it affects men more you know you know so we need to look at these issues they are really really an issue you know issues of substance abuse um there's quite a lot of substances that are abused um in south africa you know alcohol you know, other substances like, like your drugs as well, they're, they're actually a problem. You know, and all these things, they all contribute to, to, to mental um, illness. And, you know, we really need to talk about mental illness. If there's someone in your family that you're not worried, that you're worried about, you know, they don't look okay, you know, advise them to go speak to someone, a counselor, you know, a social worker, you know, a, a psychologist, you know, so that they can be referred appropriately if they need um, any help regarding their mental illness. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. You know, uh, as you are talking about all of these issues pertaining to mental health, and I'm also, you know, reminded of the statistics around suicide to say that, you know, men are most likely to actually use more, uh, you know, like uh, serious ways of actually trying to commit, uh, uh, you know, uh, suicide as well because of their strength and because of the way that they are sort of like conditions and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it's very hard for them once they try it. Most of the times they become successful in what they are doing. And mm -hmm. uh, that's one part. I think that we need to talk about these things. We need to engage with a lot of people. We need to sit down as men to look at to some issues that we can actually advise each other about and uh, look for help whenever I can. And that is actually not a sign of weakness at all to actually look for help. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's actually a sign of, th of strength sign of to strength. be able to, yeah. to identify that you actually do need help and, and then you go mm -hmm. and actually look for help. But I mean, before we, 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 we just uh, uh, close, Doc, uh, and thank you very much for all the questions that you've actually you know, uh, uh, answered on this. But one would then you know, would want to know about uh, Indota, the men, you know, as uh, your baby, what, what does it entail and what is it all about? Would you be in a position right now at the end of this conversation to tell us more and in depth about Indota? Okay, so Indota is a, an initiative that I founded uh, sometime last year. So Indota, as you know, means men um, and the, the purpose of Indota is to bring um, male or men's healthcare issues to the fore. And our vision at Indota is to empower men to make the good or appropriate health choices. You know, so our motto is actually choices to health. We want to empower men to make good health choices. So we want to give them the tools, we want to give them knowledge um, regarding um, which issues will affect them more and ways in which 
they can prevent some of these issues or seek treatment. Um, so that is our focus at Indota. Uh, it's actually a growing initiative and you know, we'll be putting out a lot of content uh, related to, to men's health issues, you know, and you know, if someone wants to, to follow us at Indota um, so that they can be, have access to all our content, you can follow us on three ways. Um, so we are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So on uh, Instagram, you just find us at Indota underscore wellness. So if you just search for Indota, on Facebook, we're there at Indota Health, or you just search for Indota Health on Facebook. And we've actually got a, a, a YouTube channel, Indota Health and Wellness, where we actually post um, videos uh, that are related to, to men's health issues and you know a lot of information that is helpful and beneficial for men to know so that they can uh, keep and stay healthy. You know, our vision is we want healthy men. You know, if we've got healthier men who will live longer um, and have a better quality of life, you know, it will improve the, the quality of our society. Um, you will have less families that are affected by men who are dying prematurely or, you know, less loss of breadwinners to families because, you know, a man died at an early age for from some preventable illness. So that is our goal at Indota. Um, so we encourage um, people to follow us and, um, you know, especially the men uh, or even uh, women, because sometimes you've got men in your life and men are reluctant and sometimes they need a push. So yeah. it's also important for you as a woman to know some of these things so that the men in your life can also, um, you know, help be helped to, to know some of these things. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, before we close then this conversation today, do you have any parting words that you would like uh, us to know about uh, anything that you would like us to know? Yeah, so Dr. Kumet, my parting words, it's really a plea to all men that men, let us be aware of um, the issues that affect men. There are plentiful of these issues. Let us be aware, you know, empower yourself with the knowledge. Um, you know, we live in a day and age now where um, it's easy to get knowledge. You know, it's no longer for, you know, you no longer find it at the universities. Now you can find it on the internet. There's so many platforms like mine, like yours, Dr. Kumete, where people can get information um, regarding their health and being empowered. That is my, my, my parting words. I also want to give a plea to men, let us not be shy to seek help. You mm -hmm. know, if there is a problem, do not spend days and days and weeks before you seek help. Go and seek help at the earliest sign so that the problem can be addressed. Uh, we need to change our health seeking behavior as men um, because unfortunately it impacts on us uh, negatively. And a lot of these things are, are preventable. So as men, let us become more and more involved. You know, let us have more and more conversations as men regarding our health. You know, let us not only talk about, you know, uh, what's happening in politics, what's happening, you know, in the PSL, this team beat this one, you know, but sometimes let's also check on our, on our, on our, on our friends, our colleagues to be like, hey man, I'm worried. You seem to be under a lot of stress. Are you sure you're not depressed? Let's have yeah. these conversations as men. Um, so this is my my plea. Let us take more responsibility for our health, men. Wow. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Lynn Gumede, who was not able to join us today in the conversation with Dr. Uh, Gerald Mataruka, uh, I would like to appreciate you and thank you very much for the time that you've dedicated to actually form part of this conversation, to share your knowledge around men's health matters. I think this discussion was very helpful. And uh, if I was you, the listener and the viewer back at home, I would always go back to, you know, the platforms that have already been uh, mentioned of Indota, as well as the Melanin Chit Chat YouTube channels to actually get more of uh, the discussions that are going on there in order for us to be uh, geared with the right information so that we can take the right decision. So from us, I would like to say thank you very much for joining us. And again, this is Dr. Ntlagani Kukumere. I am the host for today's show, Melanin Chit Chat on Men's Health Week for today. So I'd like to say uh, goodbye for now.